to understand what's going on between China and the European Union, I think we need to have a little breakdown of who the European Union are and what's going on. So just this is from a European person's perspective. I think it's necessary uh, to talk about this before we go into it and we talk about the Chinese EV tax in Europe. Interestingly, about 25% of the people that watch my videos are under the age of 35. So you might not know who exactly the European Union were or are. And I suspect a lot of us don't really understand the extent or the severity of the mission creep of the European Union. And so this is a part of the, uh, you know, my reasoning for talking about this in this video. So the European Union was born out of a desire to prevent future wars following the devastation in World War II. Pretty plain and simple. It just wasn't known as the European Union at that point, but it definitely was the European Union. Uh, 1951, 1951, six countries, I think it was Belgium, France, West Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, they all signed what was called the Treaty of Paris to create uh, the European Coal and Steel Community, otherwise abbreviated as the ECSC. It was primarily economic in nature. Clearly, at that point, it was clearly... 50s, 60s, 70s economic. Uh, it was designed to, you know, to control the production of steel and coal, which were two really important things at that time uh, for waging war. So just metering that and just putting some boundaries in place that could kind of prevent a future war. And then it kind of spiraled out of control from there. The underlying belief was that economic independence uh, would make war uh, between any member nations uh, undesirable or practically impossible. That was kind of the idea. In 1992, the Maastricht Treaty established the European Union as we know it today. So where, where people got the freedom of movement, for example, people like me, we can just move anywhere in Europe, pick a country, Italy, that sort of place, Amsterdam, go live there. That's pretty nice. Uh, so the European Union now had its own judiciary, parliament, European Court of Justice, and a central bank. And then in 1999, they created their own currency, uh, the euro. 17 out of the 27 member states decided to take that uh, sharing monetary policy and they adopted this single currency which transcended uh, national borders. So that marked a really big you know, tipping point for the European Union, obviously at that time when they created the currency because that is like a big alarm bell thing for some people. You know, they're maybe making the whole of Europe into a country it seems, you know, America, Russia, China, Europe. So, I don't know, what do you think about that? That's the thing uh, that people do talk about, but nobody really talks about it on, uh, on mainstream media, for sure. So today, the European Union is more, uh, more than a collection of countries. It functions almost like a supranational state. And I really think it does. Its, it's power extends into many areas previously reserved for national governments. Uh, such as trade, immigration, and even uh, defence, because the European Union, obviously, they wanted to create their own uh, military, basically, and they're talking about military union, uh, union uh, you know, putting un the militaries together in the European Union, having some sort of laws and rules in place to, uh, to make it so that they can kind of share stuff, that sort of thing. So recent moves toward a uh, unified military force under the common common security and defense policy or the csdp uh, signals the european uh, signal the european union's uh, act, ambitions to act not just as an economic entity uh, but as a geopolitical force so there's mission creep clearly going on at this point and we're only in you know year 1999 only been around for so many years over time the european union has grown in power and scope, becoming more like a supranational uh, entity, kind of like a super state. And at the minute, Chinese cars imported into the European Union from China just get a very standard 10% tax. That all seems pretty reasonable. I don't think people you know, have anything to say about that, really. The Chinese government supported its businesses in China. You know, they, they obviously uh, they had plans to take market share around the world china i'm talking about the state of china and uh yeah that is why they supported their businesses that were producing goods that could go out and go out into the world and uh you know take some of the market share that's what's going on so the european union and frankly the globe understands that there are a few things at play here just like four or five things hear me out 
I know it might sound a bit unrelated to the video, but it really is related. And uh, maybe even it sounds on the surface, especially in 2024, you know, uh, conspiratorial. But it is vital, I think, that you hear these things, just so that we're all on the same page. Because I think a lot of us would give each other the knowing nod and say, yeah, I understand completely what you're saying. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories here, because there are some things that are all going on at the same time, which impedes our ability, I think, to talk about these things as a collective uh, cohesively. And I don't think any of these things are me being... I don't think any of these things are me being anything other than on the proverbial fence. I'm just, I'm just highlighting them, you know? I think that's just a reasonable thing to do. So I'm touting the fact that these things are a part of our current landscape, uh, nothing more. That's all I'm doing. I just don't want to ignore them when it's, you know, I want my video to offer an insight into the truth, not what I as a YouTuber dare to speak of and excluding the important stuff, but actually just including all of the truth, basically. So that's why I just want to say these things in the video. Number one, the world does need to alter. We're literally burning stuff every day to fly in an aeroplane, drive our cars, that sort of stuff. We're literally altering the, the atmosphere. This is not a good thing. It's documented and true. Almost almost everybody agrees with that. It's 99 point something percent of people just agree with that. That is a thing that we just, we just are aware of. That is a part of our, our modern, uh, you know, 2024 reality. Uh, another thing, number two, the power that can be garnered from electrifying our society for the state is unparalleled. They will get access to so many areas of our lives uh, from electrifying our society. Uh, that, that is something to just be aware of and just to not put in the back of our minds, but just to be aware of it, I think, as we, as we go through the next five years or ten years. Uh, they will have access, access to what we say online, uh, where we spend our money, you know, where we travel, when we travel, what we booked our accounts, obviously. There are now agreements in place with WhatsApp and YouTube and Facebook to uh, give the governments quite literally an art of AI uh, backdoor to just comb what we say and what we do, and then they can flag stuff up and either uh, tell YouTube, they've already approved this, by the way, to uh, delete stuff at their behest, basically. They can just say, YouTube, take that down, and it's gone. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is down for simply just verbalizing uh, modern, you know, something that's real. So yeah, there are lots of conspiracies all over. It's rife, that's a bit of an issue, but they all seem so futuristic and somehow distant when they are clearly all of the now. It is very, very weird to think that now we're in a time where uh, our cameras constantly look and hunt for your face to uh, give it the tick and allow you into your phone. It's constantly doing that and your thumbprint. So we use biometrics now. I don't think this would really alter the, the mind of the individuals in the European Union, for example. I don't think as an individual, you know, some of these people or even the elites and stuff are sitting there thinking I would love to get some control of lots of people. But as a collective, I think most governments, most states, the European Union, uh, you know, they probably do allow it to in, you know, impact their decisions and uh, alter what they do decide on to do certain things, you know. So it could be a thing in their heads as a group, probably just not as individuals, that's my belief. Uh, the European Union are aiming to fend off damage caused by its residents. That's, you know, its residents sending huge wads of money, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 euros, uh, basically offshore to China, uh, arguably to the, to the enemy. We generally don't have any allegiance in Europe to China. And I think effectively, uh, the European Union views the relationship between China and the European Union uh, as basically it's a business relationship. There's no allegiance, no friendship. There's not really, a, you know, much fondness there at, at, at all. It's really just all about the exchange of money, I suppose, and just fending off threat and not trying to provoke a war, basically. Uh, so whilst we push like mad to build a competitive market for EVs, uh, the European Union is plain and simple just thwarting the sale of Chinese EVs just so that we can remain in business here with our own money staying within our super national, you know, super nation. It just seems that's what's going on. So those things collectively, I think they're just things that we should be aware of. It's just pretty, pretty basic. I should say 
since I was a kid, I've always had a, a passionate love for Europe. But the European Union is just a different thing, clearly. And I think it's just nice to make that distinction, you know, especially in my videos. Europe is one thing, the European Union is another dark beast, I think. It, it, it has definitely mutated and suffered very much uh, from uh, mission creep and obviously now has a hunger for power. Uh, hence why it is also known as a quasi-state, by the way. I once referred to it as a quasi-state and got lectured majorly in the comments for some reason when it clearly kind of is. Uh, a quasi-state is basically a state without formal recognition of being a state, but it has most of the you know, the uh, fundamentals covered of being a state. So with all this being said, you will now know something about the European Union and why they are the way that they are. I ran a poll about the European Union and it turned out that most people didn't have a good understanding uh, on what the European Union's focus was. So I thought, I just have to mention it in one of my videos. A few months ago, the European Union decided to make their uh, decision public about uh, adding taxes on top of the initial 10% to Chinese EVs uh, up to 35.3%. This was now just formally voted on by the various European nations. Uh, in a nutshell, they all agreed the ones that didn't had a fairly transparent justification as to why they voted against an increase in taxes. Uh, BYD, for example, are, are building a massive European uh, hub or a factory, manufacturing plant in Hungary. So, of course, Hungary voted against it. That is a big deal. Uh, countries such as Spain also voted against taxes, uh, no, for the taxes. And then, actually, after uh, some cashed up diplomats from China, rocked up and, and were literally spotted going into meetings over a course of a week or two, uh, they reversed the decision. So that seems a little bit transparent, doesn't it? Basically now these ta taxes are going ahead on October 31st, unless China and the European Union reach a deal, they will not. It is odd, isn't it, I think, how now we refer to Europe as the EU or Brussels. I just think that's very odd. So there is a change in the water there. I don't remember hearing that so much 10 years ago. It's all indicative of what I had uh, previously mentioned, I think. So the reason given for the taxes by the European Union was because uh, the Union believed that China had made life easier. This is the reason given, by the way. Uh, made life easier and therefore unfair for its manufacturers. They've given BYD, for example, I think it was uh, so many, a lot of money. It was a lot of money. It was definitely a lot less than the profits, but it was a lot of money. Uh, so this could now cause damage uh, simply because they can now produce a car cheaply and sell it to us, which kind of disrupts and rocks our boat and disrupts our market, our industries, that sort of thing in Europe. Uh, so that's the reason given. So China literally did what a state should do. Right? I mean, if you had, for example, a Norwegian uh, car company come up and they wanted to build a car company, uh, a few, some business people came and they were very, very good. And the state of Norway has a, a, a vested interest in uh, the economy. Obviously, it is the state. And so they might give a little bit of support, some subsidies, a bit of free land, that sort of thing, to the company, maybe in, for some shares in return or something like that. I don't know. That is kind of ordinary. Not weird at all, but that was the, that was kind of what they did in China, uh, quite a bit actually. So uh, that's and they they were able to make these cars cheaply and sell them to us and uh, rock our industry a little bit. So that's kind of what's going on. They're just trying to thwart, uh, you know, thwart Chinese EV manufacturers, you know, selling them to us. It seems not not unethical at all. Obviously, the Chinese have done some unethical things and are still doing some unethical things. I'm sure someone will mention some things in the comments, uh, sure. But that's just not what my channel is about. I talk about electric vehicles. So uh, Beijing engaged in extensive diplomatic efforts to influence the vote, including outreach from senior Chinese officials like uh, President Xi Jinping. He uh, went places and shook the hands of people to try and, you know, coerce them into some sort of, I guess, allegiance of some sort. Uh, so they targeted individual European countries with, with economic incentives, such as a promise of, uh, you know, like the, the BYD plant, even though BYD have already announced they're doing it and they bought the land. They made a promise, we will definitely do it if you don't vote in this 
uh, election or this vote for against us, you know. Germany, which has deep economic ties with China, uh, you know, they it, with their very, very strong and very large automotive sector, Mercedes, they love Mercedes in, German, in uh, China. Uh, they oppose the tariffs, fearing a potential trade war. It, it is annoying, you know, for these manufacturers when one person puts a tax up, so they retaliate, and then basically everybody loses. Nobody wins at all. Maybe you could say the state possibly wins a little bit. There's some extra tax, but basically the sales drop dramatically. It's a standoff, basically, hence the term trade war. It's not good for anybody. Uh, the resistance is rooted in uh, concerns about disrupting major trading relationship, you know, while simultaneously hurting Germany's own auto industry. This is a thing that we were talking about eh, three months ago, two months ago. This sort of situation would be difficult for any state or bunch of politicians, but it's made even more difficult because of the nature of modern politicians these days having a complete inability to uh, articulate reasonable thoughts <laughs> ever, basically. So yes, perhaps the EU, EU can preserve industry in Germany and Italy, for example, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of life goes up for the residents of these uh, people or these pe the people in these countries or the European Union simply because of a few a few extra yachts appear in a marina in Monaco literally is irrelevant. For example, the UK the quality of life not so good for a lot of people these days. There's some really serious concerns about what's going on in the UK and how uh, things have gone in the last 30, 20, 30 years and where it's at right now. But it is a filthy rich country, you know. Norway exactly the same. Uh, the quality of life, I'm hearing some concerns there compared to 10 years ago, even though I immeasurable amounts of, um, amount of money in the bank account there, in the Sovereign Wealth Fund, mental, effectively, the government have a massive bank account. They could really make life a bit easier, make food a bit cheaper or that sort of thing, but uh, kind of not, I suppose. It's just kind of capitalism, but, you know, it's uh, even though you would argue that it's communist in Norway, but still... Uh, it goes on, you know, selling electric via the cable to the Euro Euro uh, to the continent, basically. So Chinese efforts to sway the vote included a mix of uh, what you could just say is diplomatic carrots and sticks, so to speak. Nothing unusual about this approach, just trying to form an allegiance very quickly, and, uh, doing whatever they want to do. It's just business acumen. They're look, they've got a state to uh, service, basically. So just to give you some sort of perspective here, the tariffs are designed to counteract the substantial growth in the market share of Chinese EVs in the European Union, which jumped from 2% in 2020 to 14% uh, four years later in 2024, basically. So it's uh, a big market share, you know, compared to what it was just four years ago. So it's just a thought that, I suppose. A couple of things to remember. New laws can be created, and they are created, and existing laws can and will be bent. This is actually something Julian Assange said in front of a panel of uh, European, I don't know, very important people in Europe. I can't remember who, it was, who, who he was talking to. And uh, yeah, this new, these new taxes for the Euro from the European Union are only supposed to be in place for five years. So we will see what they do. But thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Ben Alexander, and I make EV News videos. I really appreciate your time watching my videos and that uh, you've made it this far. So this was a long one. So thank you. Uh, please put any thoughts in the comments for everyone to see, because I'm pretty sure when I talk about some of these things, people will be just going straight to the comments, which is interesting. I know this video is somewhat loaded. I know that as a society, generally, we're unable to talk about these sorts of issues without conflict. So I'm expecting some conflict in the comments. But whatever you put in the comments can just go if we could at least try to keep things reasonable and uh, a bit civil in the chat, that'd be really nice. So thank you for watching. Really appreciate it.